Okay, so we are now live. We'll wait for some people to come in. Hey, Richie, welcome. This is always the awkward silence part where you, when no one says anything, it's like standing in a lift together. I know, we need to get somebody to tell a story. I know. We always say that we need some music at this point, Keenan. I know. Keenan, I know. If only, if only we had a musician that could sing a song. <laughs> yeah, somebody that could sing. <laughs> Gotta be somebody. Gotta be someone out there that could sing something <laughs> while we're waiting. Hey, but, yeah. downstairs. I have to run back down now. <laughs> Hey Philip, hey Shona, welcome. Thanks for joining us on a sunny evening. Joining joining me in my, my very dark attic. <laughs> I'm going to come out with uh, out, of, out of lockdown with vitamin D deficiency. <laughs> well, I, I've not, I don't think I've been outside for about three weeks. You've been in, there, in your cave. In my cave, my stress just, cave. Just drinking beer. But I have fancy new tech. I'm just going to show off to everyone right now. Look at this. Check this out. Oh, camera number two. Rachel's very jealous. I don't have a curtain like Rachel, though. I'm, I'm waiting for that. I was saying to everyone uh, that this is, this is you have to breathe in on this angle. So you can't slouch when you're, when you're here. So if I start slouching down. Camera, uh, Rachel, let's see your, your second camera. Oh, you don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> not this week buddy you've got a new not haircut you've got, got a new, you've got a new I've haircut got a tell everyone about that lockdown quiff uh-huh how did you how did you do that quiff. did you do that yourself uh, no uh, my husband did it he's quite chuffed with it mm -hmm. it's because he's bald so not that i'm you know I'm not bringing that up in any way but i just you know what? for people that have here just a lockdown quiff is always a, a lovely what, what are you saying about baldness can you, can you, I think she's talking to you. Talk, me? Talking to you, buddy. <laughs> yeah, I've yeah, got the good. lockdown quiff and Tamara's got the gold cape. There's a lot of uh, Vegas vibes is... going on in here today. Oh, there's Barbara. Hi, Barbara. There's a wee chat box. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Loving the hair, Rachel, Barbara says. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. <laughs> Wait till I get another camera as well next time. Oh. Well, like this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm breathing. Cool. Well, I think to keep us on time, Rach, you just decide when you want to start. Hey, Michael, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Brilliant. Well, welcome. And first off, I just want to say a big hello to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us, especially on this sunny evening. And um, we're always really appreciative of the time that you give us. So genuinely, thank you for joining in. So those of you who don't know me, my name is Rachel Brown and um, I'm with Creative Entrepreneurs Club. And we're a networking, upskilling membership organisation. Um, that is all focused on giving the creative industries and creatives the skills and the tools that they need to flourish. So the aims of this series and what we're hoping to cover really is pretty fundamental. Some of you might realize, uh, right, have joined us before might remember that Andrew and I have been doing this for a few weeks now and Andrew's going to fill you in on a bit about that journey. Um, but we really wanted to bring something a bit about celebrating creatives, celebrating people who are out there doing it all the time. So today I'm delighted that we've got Tamara Schlesinger with us, aka Malka, who is a singer-songwriter. Um, and previously Tamara was former lead singer, critically acclaimed um, UK indie folk outfit, Six Day Riot. Um, many of you will know who that is, many of you don't, but Tamara and um, Six Day Riot, firm favourite of BBC Six Music, um, featured on TV series and Hollywood block Busters such as Skins, Scream 4, which is personally my favourite, Scream, I don't know about anybody else, but uh, Scream 4 is easily the best, um, and 127 hours. So this is about homegrown talent today, and it's a, hopefully a, a, going to be an inspirational session. And to kick us off, I'm going to pass back over to Andrew. Thanks, Rachel. 
Great. And uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us again on this evening. Um, it's nice and sunny outside, so I do appreciate you all staying in for that like extra hour. Tonight, we're going to try and stick um, as best we can to six o'clock for you all. So, um, yeah, we'll do our best to, to stay to that. So this is the first in the new series of webinars um, in terms of Rachel and myself have been running these for a few weeks. However, this one is very much focused on inspiring you um, and sort of inspiration and creativity. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Andrew Dobie. I'm the founder of a creative brand agency based out of Glasgow called Made Brave and also run a content agency over in Edinburgh called Campfire. Um, Rachel and I, you know, we, we, did, we kicked these off at the beginning of the sort of COVID, um, COVID days. I don't know what you, what you say for the beginning of this period, um, you know, when, when everything sort of kicked off. And I suppose we were trying um, very early on um, to work towards creating something of value for the creative industries and to support you all. Um, so we first of all created a LinkedIn support group, which is called Creative Industries COVID Support over on LinkedIn. There's about about 4,000 people have joined that group over there. Um, and then Rachel and her team um, over at Creative Entrepreneurs Club have also kindly uh, gifted their platform, um, which is creativeentrepreneursclub.co.uk, where we now have a job board where people are sharing jobs for people in the creative industries. Um, there's also a one-to-one -one support network. So um, myself, Rachel, Keenan, and a whole host of other people are there. And you can book creative time. Well, not creative time, you just book time. Time is, you know, you can do, you can make it creative if you want, but you can book time with us. And if we can help you and support you in any way um, you can pick at our brains and if we can't we'll try and figure out um, people around in our network that can help you as well so um, yeah previously on this um, th these webinars we've had a whole host of kind of business experts and um, we you know we had John Letham um, who's a qualified executive coach a mentor and a consultant um, and he gave us a lot of practical tips about mental health and well-being which is obviously you know um, something you know that's very important right now that we're, we're all looking after each other and um, you know um, supporting each other. Um, if you're struggling in any way, please make sure and reach out. You can reach out to one of us if you, you're looking for a bit of help and support, um, but please make sure and, and speak to someone if you are. Uh, previous to that, we had Mark Logan, um, of, um, one of the original founders of Skyscanner, and he talked a lot about resilience and how to stay resilient in times like this. If you want to check any of these out, we've posted them back on the Made Brave um, YouTube channel. Your search Made Brave on YouTube and Rachel's team have also posted them on the Creative Entrepreneur Club website as well. Um, so as Rachel mentioned, I mentioned a minute ago, we've kind of decided to pivot a little bit in terms of, um, you know, we wanted to kind of have a clear focus for these webinars moving forward. And, you know, creativity lies at, uh, you know, the heart of my organization, at the heart of um, Rachel's organization. And at a time when, you know, there's lots of challenges going on um, for all of us, and, and they're playing out in different ways for everyone creativity and, and feeling inspired is the one thing that, that you know can give us that little bit of energy and send us off in a different direction um, so you know at made brave we, we talk about our purpose is to inspire creativity in everyone and, and so our hope is that, that during this series we can do that and so we've brought on a whole host of inspiring people and people have inspired us in the hope that they'll do the same for you um, and it might be just something uh, that Tamara says today that you know sparks a, a change in direction in your life um, or gives you that little bolt of energy that we all kind of need right now. Um, you know, and, you know, creativity, if, you, if you're sitting there and you're thinking, I'm not a creative, you know, we believe there is creativity in everyone. It's just, it comes to life in different ways. And so, you know, so during these sessions, hopefully you'll be inspired um, and hopefully, you know, we'll help you bring some of those ideas that you have internally to life. Rich. Brilliant. So for those of you who are just joining us, we're going to do a quick interview with Tamara, who, aka Malkar, singer-songwriter. Um, and previously, Tamara did head up uh, the critically acclaimed UK indie folk outfit, 60 Riot. But her solo albums and her highly praised debut album, Marching to Another Beat, received a steady support at Six Music. And we were just talking earlier on that Amy LeMay was out playing all of Tamara's new stuff on Sunday. Lauren Laverne is a big fan. Steve Lamack is a big fan. Um, and they're both, she's both featured also on MTV and Netflix. I playlisted on BBC Radio Scotland, as you would expect, and also high profile, the independent, um, the line of best fit down and, and drowned in sound. Now, one of the things that's totally brilliant, I think, about um, Malka, we'll call you Malka, because let's just do the, the, the key piece, about Malka and, and the, the approach and the talent is that it's recorded, it's produced, it's developed, um, really driven by uh, Tamara's 
focus and creativity. So this isn't somebody who has a whole range of different people writing for her, a whole range of different people playing for her, a whole range of different um, things going on around her. This is somebody that's creatively driving all of the output herself, as well as creatively driving all of the business um, aspects of the music industry as well. And I think that's something to be celebrated and something that we can take um, inspiration from. So five years, three albums into solo project with Malka, Tamara's newest album, I'm Not Your Soldier, was released at the end of February, right just before the pandemic. So we can either take that as we look back as great timing or poor timing, whichever way we want to uh, discuss it tonight. Um, so just before we, we kick off for the interview, just to remind you that um, People like Tamara and others are part of the Creative Entrepreneurs Club as well. We have groups available. We're in 43 different cities. We have over 1,100 people in the club. So as well as us being able to support you um, from your Scottish space, we're also able to support you from an international and global space. And I think given the fact that we're talking about creativity as a wider inspiration, it's always good to know that um, we're boundaryless. There's no geography when it comes to creativity. We can be working anywhere and with everyone. And I know that from a Made Brave perspective and from a Create Entrepreneurs Club perspective, that's hugely important. It's not just the fact that we're based here in Scotland. We're powered here from Scotland, but we have global ingenuity within us. So um, I'm going to yeah. kick off now back to you, Andrew, with your first question, and we're going to hear from Tamara. Sure. So just before I um, ask our first question, I just want to remind everyone that we have a Q&A box down the bottom, down here somewhere. So as we're as we're talking to Tamara, if you have any questions that pop into your head, pop them in there. We'll pull them out um, and ask. Um, and so don't be scared to do so. There's also a chat function as well, so um, you can you can pop any conversations that you're having in there as well as we go. So Tamara, thank you so much for joining us, uh, and thank you. And you know, we 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 made Tamara go and get her gold jacket um, before this. She, she, you know, we we. Fought forced her into this we bullied her into going and getting that jacket and you've got a helmet there somewhere as well so um yeah there we are there so the helmet you know come on at some point as well <laughs> thanks very much um so i suppose um just in your own words tomorrow like what you know when people ask you what you do you know how, how how do you describe yourself i guess i have what you call a portfolio career um first and foremost i think of myself as an artist and as a musician um i write uh my own music as malka i write for TV and for film, as we heard about. Um, I've been running my own record label now for 15 years, so I'm a director of my own record label and I'm also a lecturer in music business. So um, I kind of, I guess, I see myself as someone that needs a portfolio career and enjoys having a portfolio career. How did you get into this, Tamara? What, how Excellent. did you start? Like, when you jump off and go, I mean, did you go home one day and say, you know, mum, dad, I'm going to be a musician? Um, I, I was um I was down in London at St Martin's I was studying fashion um hence probably the gold cape um <laughs> and um and I was enjoying it but um I I kind of I knew I was creative and I didn't really know where to put my creativity I suppose um and while I was there I had a few friends that had some record producer friends that needed a vocal on a track and I'd never sung in a studio in my life I'd sung in a choir and I'd done other things and um I just said yeah yeah sure I can go and do that so I went in and I auditioned and I got the role and I sang a cover of Boots Are Made For Walking which was used in Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels um I got completely ripped off but I basically realized that that was where I wanted to um, focus my creativity and um, it was a pretty good start I suppose that was a quite a decent break for me um, and so from then on in um, I started to write my own material and um, sing in, on other people's tracks and just kind of build my own career in that way. Yeah. And do you think that was a big sort of pivotal part then even though you know you may have made money out of the track and you know that often happens with creativity you know sometimes we don't understand the value when you know when we're learning and understanding you know the value that we put into the world do you, do you think you know that 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 helped springboard you into a lot of other things or? Yeah I think so I think you know it, it not only gave me that break but it kind of gave me other contacts I started to work with other producers um other writers and um yeah it definitely did it definitely was the springboard for me. Then you kicked off with Six Day Riot. How did that come about? Because that was that was a bit of a another pivotal moment, but it kind of blew up. It was massive. 
Yeah, it was, it's such a funny thing with Six Day Rides. So um, after this um, Boots Made For Walking track, I started to work on solo material and I wrote a solo album. Um, and there was a tiny little indie label in London that were about to release this record. And they went bankrupt just as they were about to release it. But in the process, they set me up with a lawyer called Anne Harrison, who anyone that studied music business will have read her um, book on the music industry. And um, she had just gone so herself if you like she'd done Robbie Williams EMI deal which was huge and she'd gone and set up her own company and I was the first client she ever took on and she essentially mentored me um, and she said well just because they're not going to release it I don't see why you can't release this yourself and this was in something like I can't actually remember 2004 there, no one was really releasing music themselves never mind a, a woman or a girl um, and so um, together we kind of she she told me who I needed to get involved to make this happen and I released this record and it did okay we actually got some press coverage it did quite well but um we got noticed by a couple of different people and one of those people was a record producer called steve levine who had worked with culture club beach boys a number of other people and and he invited me to go um to his studio to work on a, my new album and at that point in my live band there was a danish friend of mine called soren who um played guitar but we'd started to collaborate more than just him playing guitar on my music and we created this new sound which we decided to call six day riot so that came together at the same time as steve looking to work with me and so Sora and I became Six Day Riot um, and we went in the studio with Steve so that was the start of Six Day Riot and Steve was behind it initially and then I then took it on myself and um, released everything myself and it's interesting because yeah it did do well but when you're doing it you're always striving for more and we had major labels interested and various things went wrong with every deal as you know as the stories go but um I don't think we realised, or certainly I didn't realise how successful it was until it ended because I always wanted to achieve more than it ever achieved. And it actually achieved a lot in hindsight. In Retrospect hindsight. or whatever, yeah. <laughs> and, and you know, you know when, you, when you talk about releasing an album, releasing, a, you know, a track, and, and, you know, the, the, the world of online is very noisy these days because, you, you know, it used to be you almost... Um, you competed with you know you, the region around you the people around you and you're you know and it was the UK you know but now the world is so connected I mean how do you go about creating the right amount of volume of noise or you know you know what, what does that look like just for people that maybe you know that are not in your world you know what does the launch of, of, of a new album look like for you yeah I think it's changed so dramatically with Six Day Riot um I think we'd just gone to iTunes at that point, you know, we were very physical in terms of <clears throat> we were making money from physical sales when we were on tour, we survived and made an income because we sold a lot of merchandise and CDs and on tour. Um, so now I have a team, I, I, I kind of run my label much as uh, and any other indie or you know major runs their label I have a PR team I have um, a plugging team so the PR team will take it to press for review um, my plugging team will push it to radio and I'm working really closely with sync agents and um, this was something that came about after skins which was um, which wasn't something I'd push my music towards TV and film at that point I'd actually got scouted and my music was used for skins but after that then followed a publishing deal and um, now I, I work with sync agents and essentially their job is to try and pitch my music for adverts um, for tv and um, those teams together along with a lawyer um, kind of are the backbone of tantrum records and they essentially allow me to kind of try and get above the noise as you say which is hard it's, it's harder I think now than it was but this so it's mm -hmm. easier in many other ways you know it's kind of as things have moved online um is that a full-time team that work with you all the time is that a remote team freelance team how does that set up work yeah so they're freelance I hire them as per project so as mm -hmm. I come towards a new record or a new EP or a new single I'll be in touch with them asking them to work yeah. with me um, and this last album I got funding from Creative Scotland and I worked with um, Paul Savage who produced the record as well so there was a producer involved in the last album. It's very interesting to hear how you know it's a different world than the world you know it's, it's got lots of parallels to the world we're in but um, you know there's a lot of uh, differences and it's quite interesting to understand you know and I think for anyone listening and when watching it's always under you know it's trying to figure out all the little pieces that make up the, the, the bigger puzzle isn't it? I think it's an you know you don't have to have all those teams that's how I've gone about it you could equally be 
submitting your music to BBC introducing and doing a lot of things without those teams I've built up relationships for many years with these people and I believe they're adding to what I do and that's why I keep using them but you know I tell my students if you don't have a budget you can find out the names of all these people that are writing and all these producers of these um, stations and you can do it yourself it's just obviously we know that having those contacts and having that in and actually getting someone to hear that music is part of the barrier that we all try and overcome really. What made you decide to do it all yourself, though, Tamara? I mean, because sometimes, you know, very often, especially in the music industry, you want just to give it all away. So I used to work um, in, in, in the music industry and, and, you know, very seldom did you come across artists, especially female artists that had complete control. Um, so what made you decide to do it? I think... Um once I'd released that first record and realised that I could have a control over the sound, all the majors, you know, we had EMI, we had RCA back in the day, they were all interested in signing us and inevitably it didn't work out, but they all wanted something different. They wanted me to be the front person without soaring around. They wanted me to look a certain way. They wanted something to change with the sound. No one just wanted to take us as we were. And I think that was something when you feel you have a belief in what you're doing and a sound you're creating and a vision of, the entire identity that you just as the years went on and as I was doing and as I was you know like we said we we're playing Glastonbury we we're you know on Radio 2 on Six Music we we're touring with Bell and Sebastian Deacon Blue it wasn't so shoddy for someone doing it themselves and I think as you started to realize well it's actually going okay I, I there's times now so I think especially now that I've got the kids and I'm busier than ever that I sometimes think I wouldn't mind someone helping but I think I've now become this is who I am I don't know that I'd be able to even give up that control and I, I like being able to cr create um, a visual that goes with my sound. I like being able to put out content I'm proud of and I like to be able to feel like it is me and what you're getting is me and no one shaped that and no one has pushed that and as the years have gone on I, the business side for me is as creative as the music. I love finding different routes and working out marketing strategies and adapting and you know so I, I think I just enjoy it all. That's the, the truth of it. Yeah, and, and I suppose I'm interested to know, you know, you, you kind of talked about, you know, in terms of you want the purity of your own creative, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, we work with a lot of creative people all the time. And, you know, um, I think there's, there's, there's advantages to both, isn't there? There's sometimes you leave someone who's clearly a specialist, they've got some piece of magic, and it's amazing, and just let them go at it. But then other times, you know, you put creative people together and you you almost create something that's better than some of the parts and you know I suppose there's no right answer there but um you know I, I yeah I suppose I'm just focusing in on the point that you know you you feel I suppose that, that, that you want to hold on to that purity of what your piece of creativity is is that is that fair I enough think, to say I mean, to a degree working with Paul for me was great it was the first time in a long time that I was willing to collaborate and get someone else's ideas and I don't think I'm ever afraid of that I'm co-writing a lot more with people I'm doing a lot more but I suppose with Malka and the sound of Malka that's a very personal thing whereas co-writing a song with someone else and collaborating with someone else on anything else I feel much more comfortable so I actually love collaborative work I, f I think it's it 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 should stretch your mind, it should make you have more ideas. And had I not worked with 60 Riot with my old bandmates and then with Paul, I don't think I would have the ideas I'm having now. So you can never on your own have new ideas. I don't think you always need to have someone to bounce things off. But um, yeah. I, think, I think for me, there's no one to blame, is there, right? If it doesn't go well, <laughs> it's my fault. So um, I guess maybe I like that. I feel secure in the fact that, you know, it's it's a challenge that I'm rising to myself in terms of releasing the music as well. So how can I go? Is this is it is the process different? Because if you write music and it's for a film or an advert, essentially you might have been given some inspiration or a brief potentially, or you know the subject matter, or the, and so do you create it differently for that than you do for your own music, or do you just put out your own music and hope? Say, well, if it fits, great. If it doesn't. Um, so initially the process has been I've created written an album and it's been picked up and that's been great um, and now the agents I'm working with have started to come to me with briefs um, to, to pitch to brief which I'm loving it's such a challenge and it is a different way often you'll have to sound a bit like something or I have to have this mood or this lyrical content and um, you know I'm actually enjoying it and um, but it, they are very different processes I think like I said earlier, I suppose for me, Malka, there's an honesty in that. And I, I guess writing to brief that it's different. You're, you're kind of challenging yourself, but you're 
you're working someone else's ideas and what they want you to do. Um, but I'm doing more and more of writing to brief. And as we'll talk about, I'm sure later about how, how COVID has affected everyone. Um, you know, I need to find other ways to, to generate an income and I enjoy it. So I think, um, with Six Dear I and Malka, there's there's definitely a, a vision of a sound that I don't really tend to move from in terms of what I'm trying to create, whereas I'm more willing to do that with, with other material. Yeah, so, so I suppose you, you kind of led us nicely onto that question in terms of, you know, COVID and, you know, how, how has that affected, I mean, how you earn money, how you, you know, how you potentially will earn money and, you know, what are you doing to adapt? Um, and do you think other musicians, have you, you know, I suppose, have you any tips or any thoughts for them that, that might be worried that they're not getting out to do gigs and, and earn in the way that they would previously? Um, so for me, the main revenue streams for me are, um sync which we talked about um and also i get a lot of money for my music used in um shops <laughs> and pubs um so that's one impact that's gonna have um i do tour and i do gig i i had to cancel my tour um festivals have obviously been cancelled when you're in the promo trail of a record i don't tour as incessantly as others or with six day riot we used to tour heavily all the time um since having children that's a decision I've made um so I'm not as reliant on that revenue stream but I'm reliant on that in terms of um building my visibility and being out there um so that's really impacted me in terms of building this release means no one's writing about it as much as they were because I'm not out there as much as I should be um the gigs and the the reviews I was expecting with the London shows and Manchester that I cancelled haven't happened and stuff like that um I guess I've seen a lot of people adapting with streaming their gigs at home. I've seen Rasheen Murphy doing some incredible stuff. Um, and I think um, there are artists like, I don't know if anyone's seen what Laura Marling was doing, where she has um, done this gig at Union Chapel, which has not happened yet. Um, she's geo-blocked it, so only certain regions can purchase the tickets and she's limited the numbers. And mm -hmm. I think that's a really, really inventive way to kind of get around this idea because when you do a gig, it's great to stream, but we're all doing it for free, essentially, aren't we? Because we're trying to get our visibility. And I think not everyone can do that as often as they want to do that. But someone that's kind of adapting and finding these really innovative ways to connect with their audience and limiting the numbers, that feels more intimate, right? And she's, and I just think mm -hmm. it's clever. And I think, I think we're all having to adapt. For me, as being going into the studio, I'm so lucky just before this happened, I invested in a really decent interface and new mic. And, I, and I've been working heavily on my production and that's what I'm working on at the moment. And I'm producing everything here um, and at home. And so, so I guess I'm looking towards more writing to brief, more briefs are coming in, but things are slowed down for me as they have for everyone. And, you know, I, I think the reality is it's gonna take time to, to change in any you know meaningful way I suppose yeah Sorry if that was a bit depressing. But. No, 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 no. That's no. It's. I think it's. You know. It's. It's very. You know. Interesting for everyone here. You know how different people. You know how how things are affecting them, and you know, and how they're having to adapt. And I think, you know, you know, I, I took inspiration there of just you know hearing you know myself and Keenan often talk about when when you're marketing something that you know making it limited, making it scarce in terms of you know zooms often do well because you know people say there's only hundred there's only hundred spaces on that, so people go off to register very quickly, and you know, and and it works across you know luxury brands it works across music and you know and i think that's a really nice way to do it um online so um yeah no it's not depressing at all it's, it's inspiring um I, i'm interested to understand your creative process um so forget the kind of um writing to brief for a second um when you write for malka and you know you, you sit down to write a new track um what, what does that look like and what what does the perfect creative process look like for you if you if you if, if there's such such a one <laughs> When I, um, just to go back when I was working with 60 Riot, my songwriting would start with a lyric. Um, and often I would, I would kind of look at news pieces and I try and understand these awful stories I might see. And that would be a way for me to express my feelings by writing these lyrics. And then I would form them into songs. And um, that was all acoustic. Was, with Malka, I didn't want to touch an acoustic. I didn't want people to, because I was the leader of 60 Riot. I wrote everything. I didn't want people to wonder why I didn't maintain that name if I was continuing to do music so I went electro and I I you know I, I started working with drum loops and I didn't touch an acoustic um for the first two records and just worked a rhythm so I had a rhythm and that would create a melody and now I'm somewhere in between now I kind of I, I'm not afraid to pick up my acoustic to write a melody line I'm 
I, my second album, Rat Tat Tat, had a lot of political commentary. Um, and I think there's a balance between where I am in life right now. This record is probably a lot more about where I am, very honest and kind of unusual for me because I like to have a character behind my lyrics. Um, and so I guess there's multiple ways in which I write, but I think for me, the lyrics are important and, but melody is the key for me, like a hooky melody. I just, you can't beat it. So yeah. And rhythm, I love beats and rhythm. I love a world rhythm as well. So, yeah. So what does your day-to-day -day look like now? Because it's quite different. We're, we've got all of that stuff swirling around. Um, but do you, do you create something every day? Do you get in the studio every day? No, no, I'm looking after the kids half the time. I think, um, <laughs> Not as much as I like, but I've, I've always got my phone. If I've got any melody or any rhythm or anything, I'm recording on my phone. Um, I think what I've learned, and I learned once I had the children, and I guess even more so in lockdown, is that I need to work quickly. And so I can bash out a song in a day, and while it may not be fully complete, it's, it's the bones of a really decent song there. So I'm working quickly on my own material, and I'm kind of gathering um, different ideas, and I'm... I'm, I'm possibly working on a fourth Malco record, maybe an EP, maybe it's going to sound different from the last stuff. Maybe it's a brand new project. I don't know. I'm, I'm at the point at the moment because I'm still looking at promoting the record. It's really hard. I'm trying everything I can do. I'm getting, um, I'm working with an animator to, to do an animated music video because I can't shoot a proper music video or well animation is proper, but I can't shoot how I would normally shoot a music video. Um, I'm doing some covers of stuff. So I'm just looking at different ways to maintain the promotion and which is another creative aspect. Um, and then on top of that, you know, I mean, who isn't going to go through what we're going through and have some kind of need to write down these emotions? So I have, I have, I'm having bursts of creativity and, um, and I'm kind of, I guess the sound is a bit different from the usual Malka sound. So I'm, I'm not sure where it's going just now, but I mean, as much as I can, I'm, you know, I'm obviously creating as much as I can because it, it takes me away. It's escapism. And I guess much to everyone when you're listening or watching, a film or looking at art that's an escape and for me creating is my escape and I need it I actually need it for my own sanity to get out and get out of this world and into my other world and feel like I'm somewhere else and it works for me to do yeah that. no I agree I mean I, I, I play guitar I played guitar since I was about 15 it's probably around here somewhere you can maybe <laughs> somewhere <laughs> sitting down there um, yeah, and I found you know quite interestingly I grew up with lots of musicians played in bands for years and um, you know, I've noticed my Facebook feed is completely full of everyone sharing music at the moment. And I think there's something really nice in that, that you know, we've all been given the kind of, um, you know, the, the blessing, I suppose, in some sense of, you know, a few, a few extra hours in the day where we're usually in cars traveling or we're usually flying all over the country. And, um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, it's, it's nice to see lots of creativity coming back out. You know, I've found for me, you know, a lot of stress just now, but I've been able to get back to playing guitar and, um, you know, I found it really therapeutic for the soul, if you like. Um, and, you know, and I suppose, uh, you know, out of all this kind of stress that everyone's facing just now, there'll be lots of um, great new music, um, you know, but like, you know, a lot of people as well have the, the balance of children, you know, actually all four of us here have got the balance of children at, at home as well. And so, you know, how, how are you finding that balance between, you know, looking after the kids and, and trying to continue, your, you know, your, your obviously very successful career? I think, you know, it's hard not to get frustrated when you just have all these ideas and you wish you could spend that time. But I think in some ways, my husband's also a creative and a freelancer and we're just trying to find the positives and enjoy the moments of having the kids here um, and build something special while trying to get both of our jobs done. Um, I, I think, oh, I think it's hard, but I also think that, like I said, I kind of feel like I, I work well with pressure. So having this limited time is actually good for me. And, you know, I'm not everyone will, some people will find that more of a struggle and not be able to create, but the limitations on time mean that I'm not overthinking things. I don't have time to, to sit and worry about one note on a, you know, on the piano, whether it should be something else. I don't really have time for any of that. I just kind of bash stuff out and there's a freedom to that. And I think that that kind of will create a different sound or a different thing than you would have ordinarily done. But I think everyone will be struggling with that balance and I don't see it ending anytime soon either. So um, I'm getting the ukes out for the kids. They're bashing a bit of percussion and getting them in some backing vocals if I can. So, you know, we'll make it work. 
Do you think there is, um, is there anything that you're doing at the moment, do you think that you'll carry on? Has life changed so much that, do you think you'll ever go back to touring maybe or, or doing live gigs? Do you think there's just things that are going to be the new norm? I think, um, I don't know, for me, I don't, I love, I love being on stage, but I guess every artist loves being on stage. But I think, I guess we'll have to see how things go and whether it's sustainable not to be on stage and how people feel about that. But I think one thing I foresee remaining in the live industry is streaming the gigs. I don't see why people that couldn't get there with a disability or mm. couldn't make it for whatever reason shouldn't have the access to see that. And I don't know why that hasn't happened before. Maybe it has, but certainly that I knew about. So perhaps a separate ticket where it's cheaper that you get the streamed gig with the multicam like Laura Marlin's doing. Maybe that's going to remain. And, and that's great if that does. And maybe you could do one gig and not tour the world, but everyone could stream more. Maybe you could, like Laura's doing, I guess she's doing different times for different time, you know, across the globe. Maybe that's how it'll be. And maybe we'll all save the environment by doing something like that. So I don't know. I mean, I, the touring, the being in the van, the being in these cities, the different audiences, these are things you can't, you know, it's really special, but I think things had to change. I think things had to change in the industry anyway. The whole idea that making money from live is where everyone's making money isn't even true. You know, the, the big acts are making money live. Most artists, like with Six Direct, we actually were towards the end making money. I was just going on tour with six people in my band, a van, petrol. I'm not even taking tour managers because I just have complete control. And I'm barely breaking even on this tour with accommodation. So, you know, not many people are making a vast amount of money on tour. We just absolutely love it and we need to keep our profile raised. In fact, a lot of people are losing money on tour. So, you know, something does have to change in some way and perhaps perhaps this is the start of that, I guess. But like I said, nothing really does beat that connection with the audience in that room. And I guess that's what fans are missing and artists are missing too. Yeah. I mean, do, do you think... Oh, sorry. sorry I'm trying to go. go. No, I'm, I'm, I'm always interested about, you know, this, you know, how we make money via music and something that always really um, still interests me that, you know, platforms like Facebook and Instagram, you know, when, as soon as you upload a video with a, an artist's music on it, right, they, they block it, they ban it, right? And I'm just wondering if there's you know, such a simple model as, you know, like, you know, every, you know, if I do a cover on my guitar and upload it, it, bought, it often bans it, right? And, you know, if it gave me the option of, say, look, pay, pay 20p, 20, pay a pound, and, you know, that song can go up and it, it finds its way to the artist. I, I, I can't quite understand how that still, we still haven't got to that model yet. I know, I mean, like TikTok must be doing something different. I don't know if you've played on TikTok, but they're, yeah. you know, there, there's legitimate music right across everyone and you can you can use that content. And, and I, I suppose I'm, I'm interested just, you know, do you have an insight on kind of that, how that part of the music industry is working and the licensing? And do you think you'll see a shift towards, you know, you know, I, I almost see like let people use the music, but make sure the money trickles back down, make sure there's like a affordable way and then you get that scale and then the artists get paid. Um, I, I don't know if I'm oversimplifying it, but... I think, I think it probably is simple and people just haven't adapted. I think um, I think you're right. One of my students did a really interesting research project about Facebook blocking music. Um, and um, I think I think things will change. I just genuinely think things are going to change. I think we all know Spotify don't pay enough. We all know there are so many obstacles for an artist releasing music. Mm -hmm. And um, and like I talked about how I'm making money from sync, those royalties would be as just as important. I mean, YouTube are paying a small amount, not a lot, but mm -hmm. those royalties from someone using and covering that song or using it in the back. I get emails all the time from people saying they want to use my music. Um, and, you know, often I'll say yes. Um, but I think it, it's kind of... Yeah, things need to change. And I think there's no reason why we can't be, the, this can't be a shift. And I, I guess we just have to see how, how it goes. And there's certain people, as with every industry, that are, have the control and, and, you know, inevitably it's kind of, you have to, someone has to open up somewhere in terms of what they're going to allow to happen moving forward. But I think you're right. I think there's been like, obviously Spotify have done this tip thing, which is kind of a slap in the face. They should just add an extra penny or something to every stream. But, you know, I think um, Bandcamp have done a really interesting thing. I don't know if you know that Bandcamp have done, um, they've waived their fees once a month to encourage so they don't take a cut of any of the sales and they're encouraging mm. lots of people to go and purchase um, music each month so there's a shift back to buying um the, like people are yeah. that people are purchasing again and vinyl and physical and downloading so perhaps people are just gonna see the value of music again in a different way and perhaps you know that will be the shift is that yeah. people realize they need to pay for the art a bit more 
I've, I've always for a, for a while I've kind of looked at you know years you know, sort of you know the past few years being in the world of, again of social media etc I kind of I thought at some point you know um you know at the moment like an artist like you you're on you'll be on YouTube you'll be on Spotify you've got stuff on Facebook you've got Twitter it's a really interesting move that Spotify did the other day I don't know if you noticed that they acquired Joe Rogan's um the, 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 I think you know I don't know how much he got I think however many million but he can now his podcast is now moving over onto Spotify and it's only to be broadcast on Spotify now that's something I thought would happen for a while that the platforms would start to say they would like approach you Malka okay I'm going to give you a deal and you can no longer put your stuff on all these other platforms you only put it on youtube which means if i if i'm your fan and i want to see you I'm, i've got to go to that one place which means youtube's going to get my revenue you know when i need my premium subscription you know because i want to see your content uh, i mean do you think that joe rogan move is is part of of, of again something a, a new change um you know with spotify yeah, making that Plus, I mean, you know, title with jay-z started title which is kind of a musical equivalent of having kind of mainly Beyonce and people like that, all on one platform so that you had to go to their platform and mm -hmm. it didn't really work. Um, I, you know, I don't know why it didn't work, but Spotify just had such control and people just inevitably went for Spotify. So I think, so I think, I think you can be, t I'm not on TikTok as we talked about it because I just can't be everywhere. I just literally can't. <laughs> and, and, and some people can, and that's great. So I, I think finding the platform that works for you is great. Um, Spotify is not particularly my friend, but I'm still selling my physical and that works for me. And I, I do my crowdfunders. And so certain things work for different artists and they find their way of making mm -hmm. an income. But yeah, I mean, I think it is interesting to, to kind of, you know, we talked about, I suppose, earlier about limiting your ticket sales or limiting your audience or having one place. And maybe that's not a bad thing. I don't know. I guess you have to see how that works out. I was going to ask you, um, Tamara, about your crowdfunding approach and if there's any tips, because I think a lot of people tuning in today would be interested, because you've run a several really successful crowdfunding um, campaigns. And, but they're really hard work. There's a mm -hmm. lot of effort that goes into them. And you do some brilliant things. You've got, you've, you know, limited edition vinyl and, and merchandise and a whole range of other things. I think, yeah, you said this is so exhausting. Yeah, now I, um, my mum and dad were in the loft here packing up half my stuff, helping me out towards the end of the last one. But um, I guess that for me, I know that if I can sell a certain amount of, my album in advance I can cover the release of a record so it really works for me and I think I've over the years built up a really nice relationship with my fans through doing that so there's a real support out there so when the album comes out people are promoting it and you have this direct link and while it may not number the thousands that are engaging with this that small number for me is vital and that number of people shouting about it is so important for me um i couldn't release it without that support that's mm. the truth of the matter and although i did get creative scotland funding i needed more to actually market it and manufacture it um so i mean it's a lot about thinking of ways to engage your fan base things that are you know, not everyone's going to have access to giving access to behind the scenes recordings and um, giving access to music way ahead of release. I think it was a month before release, maybe longer, um, that I gave everyone their records and gave the, sent out the, the downloads, um, giving tickets to the launch parties. So kind of just thinking of different ways in which people that absolutely love your music would want to connect with you. Someone bought um, the lyric book that I'd written all the lyrics and all my notes in, and that went off to Germany, mm. I think. So I think, um, yeah, it's, it can be exhausting. I don't think you can start it unless you have a core fan base. You can just rely on family and friends to do that. Maybe you could, but um, you know, you need to have more than that. And you need to, I've done pledge music, but obviously we all know pledge music didn't end so well. So um, I then went on to, do we know? Yeah, with pledge music kind of ripped off their artists and they didn't pay everyone the money. So a lot of people lost out and thousands of pounds for their projects um, and were unable to fulfill them. And so I moved to Kickstarter with my recent campaign um, and a lot of people, there's lots of artists innovating. There's Stina from Honeyblood has been doing her own kind of Patreon where you just sign up on her website. Carla Easton has done something similar where they are doing their own fan clubs and you just, um, you're going direct to them so no one's taking a cut. So I think um, you're seeing more and more artists realizing that without a label or even with a label, so there's a lot of people using pledge music that were on quite decent labels to be honest. So it's a way of or you know pre-selling it's a way of knowing mm -hmm. that you've you've sold already and and financing it ahead of time but it's also just a really nice way to build a really long-term fan that will just be there you know 
through thick and thin. So I enjoy it, but um, you know, it's, it's inevitably so stressful as you get towards the end and you're just absolutely panicking that you're not going to make your target, you know? So um, I think looking at how some other artists are innovating, maybe I'll try something different next time. I don't know. I have to see how it goes. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, you know, there'll be a lot of uh, young aspiring musicians, uh, you know, they'll you know, watch this, listen to your story and, you know, trying to break into the industry and, you know, perhaps, you know, they were about to get their, you know, their, the gig they've been working towards for ages and it was just cancelled. Um, have you any tips, any thoughts or anything you would have told your younger self that you've learned now that you could pass down the chain to, to help some of these younger people starting out just now? Yeah, I mean, actually, I was thinking that the other day about people that were about to break through and what that's going to mean to them. But I think, you know, if you can continue to make that music, it's actually a good time. A lot of big artists are not releasing because they can't tour and they can't effectively promote. So the smaller acts can kind of rise a little bit to the top here, take your moment. But one thing I would always say is be patient. One thing I was always was impatient. I rushed out my third Six Day Riot album when our second one was just really just taking off. And I felt like, because I was in control, no one was saying, slow down. Um, I just rushed that third album out, I felt, and it didn't do what it should have done. And I think being patient, getting exactly the right sign, getting the right look and finding your moment. And I, I, I think there's been so many times that things haven't gone my way so often and even when you release it, even when it's going well you can feel so down about it because it's not as successful as you hoped or whatever you dreamed and there will be bumps in the road that inevitably will be but if you believe in what you're doing you know it will rise to the top at some point and maybe that's because you end up working with someone else or collaborating with someone else maybe maybe you're not quite ready yet but if you work with some someone that is ready that can guide you maybe you need a manager maybe you don't I mean there's so many different things that you may or may not need but um, I've seen a couple of my students going into managing some acts and and over that course of that one year from starting with a project and um, going into their final year, then to release them, they've actually had quite a lot of success with them. And it's been really great to see. So I think um, the song is the most important thing, right? If you don't have a good song, it doesn't matter what you look like, what, what your video looks like or anything else. You can market it till you blue in the face. If no one's going to sing that song or if it's not going to connect to them, nothing else matters. So the song is key, I suppose. Yeah. And I'm curious, um, Tamara, it's slightly different now, but you, you spent many years in London and then you made the trip back to Glasgow. And often everybody thinks that, um, you know, even in the world where we can make, you know, all of our music from our own bedrooms and we can create anything we want to create in our own space, everybody thinks you do have to go to London. Mm. Um, even in COVID-19 at the moment, people are still thinking, oh, I can't get to London. I need to get down there. I need to get down there. What's your experience like? Because you decided to come back. Um, I didn't move to London for music. I, I happened to be in London as I discovered I loved making music. The scene up here is incredible. I, I have loved coming back. And I think there is definitely um, a lack of the Scottish music reaching further afield. I don't think it's quite getting, like some of the music we're talking about up here isn't going beyond the border and some of it is. And I don't know why that is, but... I do not think you need to be in London. London is like, you know, I was always a tiny, tiny fish swimming against the tide in London. And, you know, there's so many people trying to do what you're trying to do. Um, I don't think it's necessary. I think you, you should probably tour there if touring ever happens again. That will. Um, I think you should tour there. I think you can meet people there, but you don't need to be based down there. I think, you know, this new world of Zooming, why does anyone need to be anywhere? We can, you know, we don't need to be there. And the scene here is thriving. There's so many exciting things happening up here. More and more and more things are building up here. And um, as that continues to happen, there'll be even less need to, to go down. Um, you know, we know that big things do happen down in London, but I really am excited about what's going on up here and seeing the new things. I'm, I'm on the advisory board for the SMIA now and, you know, there's so much great stuff happening here and it is exciting. So no, I don't think you need to be in London. I mean, you know, each to their own, but I'm so glad I came back. I think it's incredible. And, and yeah, like I said, we had all the major labels interested, but maybe up here, maybe it would have been different. Maybe it would have gone better. You just don't know what would have happened in a different place. So. Yeah. Mm. And I was going to ask as well about resilience because like every creative person has good days, bad days. And you've, you've said a lot of times, you know, things didn't go my way, but you kept on going. 
you need to dig deep sometimes to keep going um, and it's quite tough and something you can definitely feel sometimes that you just want to be at the point of giving up you've never been at the point of giving up so what have you done to keep building your confidence and build your resilience just to keep moving forward I think you know like you said inevitably there's times where you think oh what's the point you know and then just just when you're at that point something will happen or you know you'll go back and listen to the record and be like it's great I'm gonna just continue pushing that or a new song you've got a new idea or someone reaches out and asks to use your song or something so I just think you know, you'll have, I could have a, a time for maybe even a week, maybe two weeks, maybe a month where I'm thinking, oh, it's not going to plan, especially with this happening. I couldn't promote it. Um, I didn't really know. I was trying to look at how can I market this effectively without all these things that I'm used to doing happening. Um, but then I thought, all right, okay, so we'll release another single and we'll do another, you know, you just start strategizing in the way that if you believe in it, you're going to carry on, aren't you? I've not spent two years writing a record for no one to hear it. So I need to try and make them hear it. And so, I'll just find different ways to to pull through and I don't think there's anything wrong with feeling like not wanting to carry on I think that's completely normal and I think you know you can get really downhearted about so many obstacles you come against but um I guess it's that belief in in that you want people to hear what you're doing if that if that if you maintain that you're probably stubborn in some way as well I guess um, so we have a question from Barbara and she's just asking, what's your favorite thing to write about? Um, I think probably, um, well, that's quite, I, like I said, I never really write about my personal life that much or I hide behind a character. Um, and, but I, my last album, Ratatat, was really political. And I think obviously um, a lot of anger at the moment by what's going on in the world. So I, I can foresee writing quite a lot of um, political songs, but um I kind of try and I, I like to to read um, stories and pretend to be the character and then take the story on a new journey and my own imaginary journey. So that's probably my favourite thing to do is kind of just invent a character and, and hide behind it. But not really. I, I feel like I am the character while I'm writing that song, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I love it. Mm -hmm. And so where do you look for inspiration and, and do you have any heroes? Who is the person that you looked up to? Well, as a kid, Kylie, obviously, with my blind. Um, um, I think, you know, any strong woman and man, but I think when I started out, Anne Harrison, she's been my lawyer. She was my inspiration because she told me to go and do this. And um, I wouldn't have done it if she hadn't said to do that. And I really didn't know what I was doing. And every step of the way, she's just supported me and mentored me and encouraged me. And she's given me numerous breaks. And I think having someone that is there that, you know, will continue to tell you to carry on when, when you feel like you shouldn't or you don't want to, and will kind of um, give you some belief in yourself. And so, I mean, I've got so many different people that inspire me, but in, on a personal level, I think she's been key. And also one of my old managers, Alan McBlain, um, he got me my first ever lecturing job. And um, he got me in as a guest um, to speak to his students. And I was on this Freshers Week panel with the, the uh, CEO of um, Domino Records and Franz Ferdinand's manager and someone else, all guys, and me. And I was quite young at the time. And I just sat on this panel. I just remember being so afraid that I didn't know anything. And why was I even there? And I, my outlook on releasing music was the same as all these big, really important people, except it was just me on my own little label doing it myself. And I couldn't believe that I had the same ideas and visions and that they were agreeing with me. And that was the first time that I realized I did have knowledge to impart. And so Alan's been really important in terms of, he then went on and I got headhunted to lecture in London before I moved up. And it was Alan that had put my name out there to people. So, you know, I, you never forget these people that really kind of impact your career in these small ways that actually became one of my key ways of making a living and really important to me for my life moving forward. So yeah, Anne and Aaron, Alan have had a big impact for me. I mean, and Barbara has dropped another question in and she's asking, how has your relationship with music changed over the years? Do you love it more now from when you started or just in a different way? Yeah, I think I do actually. I think um, when I first started, I didn't really have a vision. I just, 
I think I had my degree in fashion and I didn't really understand fashion or art because I was too young. I kind of just was like designing a shirt and that's a shirt and I didn't understand the conceptual side. I don't think I should have been at St Martin's at that point. Um, but I think that was maybe similar with music. Initially I just thought a song was a song I don't, and then as I grew and to want to experiment and develop and I didn't want to sound like other people and I wanted to be different and I never quite fitted in with my music but actually that's that's what I loved you know and, and I, so I guess yeah I, I've learned and developed and I love writing now more than ever I feel I never trained um, in music I don't know the theory particularly and I don't want to because actually not knowing it is my strength in some ways and and kind of as I've gone on I know what I feel feels right with the song and that's that's how I like to to carry on but I do need to learn the theory of production if I want to get better as a producer because I can't just uh, make that up, I don't think but yeah Oh, well, thank you very much, Tamara. I think that's uh, a, a nice point to leave on there. Um, you know, we're just coming up to six o'clock and we promised everyone that we would be nicely on time. So I want to thank you, first of all, for taking the hour to come uh, and, and be on the show with us. And thanks to everyone else who came and joined in. Um, we're going to be running these sessions every two weeks now. So the next session is going to be on the 9th of June at the same time at five o'clock. Um, so make sure you turn on your notifications for Creative Entrepreneurs Club, for Made Brave or myself or Rachel and you'll see um, those flag up on your social channels. Um, you know, if you have uh, anyone that you'd like to see on the show and you want to recommend anyone um, for us, just don't be scared to drop us names as well and we'll try our best to get people on. But thanks for everyone for joining in and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you, everybody. It's been lovely. Thank thanks, Tamara. Thanks, Thank you. Bye. See you later. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.